Chapter Twenty Five of the Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Leach. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Twenty Five. They bribe the lazy quadling. Now, said Dorothy, as they stood on the mountain path, having left behind them the cave in which dwelt the hoppers and the horners, I think we must find a road into the country of the Winkies, for there is where Ojo wants to go next. Is there such a road? asked the scarecrow. I don't know, she replied. I suppose we can go back the way we came, to Jack Pumpkinhead's house, and then turn into the Winky country. But that seems like running around a haystack, doesn't it? Yes, said the scarecrow. What is the next thing Ojo must get? A yellow butterfly, answered the boy. That means the Winky country, all right, for it's the yellow country of Oz, remarked Dorothy. I think, Scarecrow, we ought to take him to the Tin Woodman, for he's the Emperor of the Winkies, and will help us to find what Ojo wants. Of course, replied the Scarecrow, brightening at the suggestion. The Tin Woodman will do anything we ask him, for he's one of my dearest friends. I believe we can take a cross-cut into his country, and so get to his castle a day sooner than if we travel back the way we came. I think so, too, said the girl, and that means we must keep to the left. They were obliged to go down the mountain before they found any path that led in the direction they wanted to go, but among the tumbled rocks at the foot of the mountain was a faint trail which they decided to follow. Two or three hours' walk along this trail brought them to a clear, level country, where there were a few farms and some scattered houses. But they knew they were still in the country of the quadlings, because everything had a bright red color. Not that the trees and grasses were red, but the fences and houses were painted that color, and all the wild flowers that bloomed by the wayside had red blossoms. This part of the quadling country seemed peaceful and prosperous, if rather lonely, and the road was more distinct and easier to follow. But just as they were congratulating themselves upon the progress they had made, they came upon a broad river which swept along between high banks, and here the road ended, and there was no bridge of any sort to allow them to cross. "'This is queer,' mused Dorothy, looking at the water reflectively. "'Why should there be any road if the river stops everyone walking along it?' "'Wow!' said Toto, gazing earnestly into her face. "'That's the best answer you'll get,' declared the scarecrow, with his comical smile for no one knows any more than Toto about this road. Said Scraps, Every time I see a river I have chills that make me shiver, for I never can forget all the waters very wet. If my patches get a soak, it will be a sorry joke, so to swim I'll never try till I find the water dry. Try to control yourself, Scraps, said Ojo. You're getting crazy again. No one intends to swim that river. No, decided Dorothy. We couldn't swim it if we tried. It's too big a river, and the water moves awful fast. There ought to be a ferryman with a boat, said the scarecrow, but I don't see any. Couldn't we make a raft, suggested Ojo. There's nothing to make one of, answered Dorothy. Wow, said Toto again, and Dorothy saw he was looking along the bank of the river. Why, he sees a house over there, cried the little girl. I wonder we didn't notice it ourselves. Let's go and ask the people how to get across the river. A quarter of a mile along the bank stood a small round house painted bright red, and as it was on their side of the river they hurried toward it. A chubby little man dressed in all red came out to greet them, and with him were two children also in red costumes. The man's eyes were big and staring as he examined the scarecrow and the patchwork girl, and the children shyly hid behind him and peeked timidly at Toto. "'Do you live here, my good man?' asked the scarecrow. "'I think I do, most mighty magician,' replied the quadling, bowing low. "'But whether I'm awake or dreaming, I can't be positive, so I'm not sure where I live. "'If you'll kindly pinch me, I'll find out all about it.' "'You're awake,' said Dorothy, "'and this is no magician, but just the scarecrow.' "'But he's alive,' protested the man. "'And he oughtn't to be, you know. "'And that other dreadful person, the girl who's all patches, seems to be alive, too.' "'Very much so,' declared Scraps, making a face at him. "'But that isn't your affair, you know.' "'I've a right to be surprised, haven't I?' asked the man, meekly. "'I'm not sure, but anyhow you've no right to say I'm dreadful. "'The scarecrow, who is a gentleman of great wisdom, thinks I'm beautiful,' retorted Scraps. "'Never mind all that,' said Dorothy. "'Tell us, good quadling, how we can get across the river.' "'I don't know,' replied the quadling. "'Don't you ever cross it?' asked the girl. "'Never.' "'Don't travellers cross it?' "'Not to my knowledge,' said he." They were much surprised to hear this, and the man added, "'It's a pretty big river, and the current is strong. I know a man who lives on the opposite bank, for I've seen him there a good many years, but we've never spoken because neither of us has ever crossed over.' 
"'That's queer,' said the scarecrow. "'Don't you own a boat?' The man shook his head. "'Nor a raft?' "'Where does this river go to?' asked Dorothy. "'That way,' answered the man, pointing with one hand. "'It goes into the country of the Winkies, which is ruled by the Tin Emperor, who must be a mighty magician, because he's all made of tin, and yet he is alive. And that way,' pointing with the other hand, "'the river runs between two mountains where dangerous people dwell.' The scarecrow looked at the water before them. "'The current flows toward the Winky country,' said he. "'And so, if we had a boat or a raft, the river would float us there more quickly and more easily than we could walk.' "'That is true,' agreed Dorothy, and they all looked thoughtfully and wondered what could be done. "'Why can't the man make us a raft?' asked Ojo. "'Will you?' inquired Dorothy, turning to the quadling. The chubby man shook his head. "'I'm too lazy,' he said. "'My wife says I'm the laziest man in all Oz, and she is a truthful woman. I hate work of any kind, and making a raft is hard work.' "'I'll give you my emerald ring,' promised the girl.' "'No, I don't care for emeralds. "'If it were a ruby, which is the color I like best, "'I might work a little while. "'I've got some square meal tablets,' said the scarecrow. "'Each one is the same as a dish of soup, "'a fried fish, a mutton pot pie, "'lobster salad, charlotte russe, and lemon jelly, "'all made into one little tablet "'that you can swallow without trouble.' "'Without trouble!' exclaimed the quadling, much interested. "'Then those tablets would be fine for a lazy man. "'It's such hard work to chew when you eat.' "'I'll give you six of those tablets if you'll help us make a raft,' promised the scarecrow. "'They're a combination of food which people who eat are very fond of. "'I never eat, you know, being straw, but some of my friends eat regularly. "'What do you say to my offer, Quadling?' "'I'll do it,' decided the man. "'I'll help, and you can do most of the work, "'but my wife has gone fishing for red eels today, "'so some of you will have to mind the children.' "'Scraps promised to do that, "'and the children were not so shy when the patchwork girl sat down to play with them.' They grew to like Toto, too, and the little dog allowed them to pat him on his head, which gave the little ones much joy. There were a number of fallen trees near the house, and the quadling got his axe and chopped them into logs of equal length. He took his wife's clothesline to bind these logs together, so that they would form a raft, and Ojo found some strips of wood and nailed them along the tops of the logs to render them more firm. The scarecrow and Dorothy helped roll the logs together and carry the strips of wood, but it took so long to make the raft that evening came just as it was finished and with evening the quadling's wife returned from her fishing. The woman proved to be cross and bad-tempered, perhaps because she had only caught one red eel during all the day, when she found that her husband had used her clothesline, and the logs she had wanted for firewood, and the boards she had intended to mend the shed with, and a lot of gold nails, she became very angry. Scraps wanted to shake the woman to make her behave, but Dorothy talked to her in a gentle tone, and told the quadling's wife she was a princess of Oz, and a friend of Ozma, and that when she got back to the Emerald City, she would send them a lot of things to repay them for the raft, including a new clothesline. This promise pleased the woman, and she soon became more pleasant, saying they could stay the night at her house, and begin their voyage on the river next morning. This they did, spending a pleasant evening with the Quadling family, and being entertained with such hospitality as the poor people were able to offer them. The man groaned a good deal, and said he had overworked himself by chopping the logs, but the scarecrow gave him two more tablets than he had promised, which seemed to comfort the lazy fellow. End of chapter 25 Recording by Eric Leach, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Leach. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 26. The Trick River. Next morning they pushed the raft into the water and all got aboard. The quadling man had to hold the log craft fast while they took their places, and the flow of the river was so powerful that it nearly tore the raft from his hands. As soon as they were all seated upon the logs, he let go, and away it floated, and the adventurers had begun their voyage towards the Winky country. The little house of the quadlings was out of sight almost before they had cried their goodbyes, and the scarecrow said in a pleased voice, "'It won't take us long to get to the Winky country at this rate.' They had floated several miles down the stream and were enjoying the ride when suddenly the raft slowed up, stopped short, and then began to float back the way it had come. "'Why, what's wrong?' asked Dorothy in astonishment. But they were all just as bewildered as she was, and at first no one could answer the question. Soon, however, they realized the truth, that the current of the river had reversed and the water was now flowing in the opposite direction toward the mountains. 
They began to recognize the scenes they had passed, and by and by they came in sight of the little house of the quadlings again. The man was standing on the river bank, and he called to them, "'How do you do? Glad to see you again. I forgot to tell you that the river changes its direction every little while. Sometimes it flows one way, and sometimes the other.' They had no time to answer him, for the raft was swept past the house and a long distance on the other side of it. "'We're going just the way we don't want to go,' said Dorothy, "'and I guess the best thing we can do is to get to land before we're carried any farther.' But they could not get to land. They had no oars, nor even a pole to guide the raft with. The logs which bore them floated in the middle of the stream and were held fast in that position by the strong current. So they sat still and waited, and even while they were wondering what could be done, the raft slowed down, stopped, and began drifting the other way, in the direction it had first followed. After a time they repassed the quadling house, and the man was still standing on the bank. He cried out to them, "'Good day! Glad to see you again! I expect I shall see you a good many times as you go by, unless you happen to swim ashore!' By that time they had left him behind and were headed once more straight toward the Winky Country. "'This is pretty hard luck,' said Ojo in a discouraged voice. "'The trick river keeps changing, it seems, and here we must float back and forward forever unless we manage in some way to get ashore.' "'Can you swim?' asked Dorothy. "'No. I'm Ojo, the unlucky.' "'Neither can I. Toto can swim a little, but that won't help us to get to shore.' "'I don't know whether I could swim or not,' remarked Scraps. "'But if I tried it, I'd surely ruin my lovely patches.' "'My straw would get soggy in the water, and I would sink,' said the scarecrow. "'So there seemed no way out of their dilemma, and being helpless, they simply sat still. "'Ojo, who was on the front of the raft, looked over into the water, "'and thought he saw some large fishes swimming about. "'He found a loose end of the clothesline, which fastened the logs together, "'and taking a gold nail from his pocket, he bent it nearly double to form a hook, "'and tied it to the end of the line. "'Having baited the hook with some bread which he broke from his loaf, he dropped the line into the water, and almost instantly it was seized by a great fish. They knew it was a great fish, because it pulled so hard on the line that it dragged the raft forward even faster than the current of the river had carried it. The fish was frightened, and it was a strong swimmer. As the other end of the clothesline was bound around the logs, he could not get it away, and as he had greedily swallowed the gold hook at the first bite, he could not get rid of that either. When they reached the place where the current had before changed, the fish was still swimming ahead in its wild attempt to escape. The raft slowed down, yet it did not stop because the fish would not let it. It continued to move in the same direction it had been going. As the current reversed and rushed backward on its course, it failed to drag the raft with it. Slowly, inch by inch, they floated on, and the fish tugged and tugged and kept them going. "'I hope he won't give up,' said Ojo anxiously. "'If the fish can hold out till the current changes again, we'll be all right.' The fish did not give up, but held the raft bravely on its course, till at last the water in the river shifted again and floated them the way they wanted to go. But now the captive fish found its strength failing. Seeking a refuge, it began to drag the raft toward the shore. As they did not wish to land in this place, the boy cut the rope with his pocket knife and set the fish free, just in time to prevent the raft from grounding. The next time the river backed up, the scarecrow managed to seize the branch of a tree that overhung the water, and they all assisted him to hold fast and prevent the raft from being carried backward. While they waited here, Ojo spied a long broken branch lying upon the bank, so he leapt ashore and got it. When he had stripped off the side chutes, he believed he could use the branch as a pole to guide the raft in case of emergency. They clung to the tree until they found the water flowing the right way when they let go and permitted the raft to resume its voyage. In spite of these pauses, they were really making good progress toward the Winky Country, and having found a way to conquer the adverse current, their spirits rose considerably. They could see little of the country through which they were passing, because of the high banks, and they met with no boats or other craft upon the surface of the river. Once more the Trick River reversed its current, but this time the Scarecrow was on guard and used the pole to push the raft toward a big rock which lay in the water. He believed the rock would prevent their floating backward with the current, and so it did, they clung to this anchorage until the water resumed its proper direction when they allowed the raft to drift on. Floating around a bend, they saw ahead a high bank of water extending across the entire river, and toward this they were being irresistibly carried. There being no way to arrest the progress of the raft, they clung fast to the logs and let the river sweep them on. Swiftly, the raft climbed the bank of water and slid down on the other side, plunging its edge deep into the water and drenching them all with spray. As again the raft righted and drifted on, Dorothy and Ojo laughed at the ducking they had received, but Scraps was much dismayed, and the Scarecrow took out his handkerchief and wiped the water off the patchwork girl's patches as well as he was able to. 
The sun soon dried her, and the colors of her patches proved good, for they did not run together nor did they fade. After passing the wall of water, the current did not change or flow backward any more, but continued to sweep them steadily forward. The banks of the river grew lower, too, permitting them to see more of the country, and presently they discovered yellow buttercups and dandelions growing among the grass, from which evidence they knew they had reached the Winky country. "'Don't you think we ought to land?' Dorothy asked the scarecrow. "'Pretty soon,' he replied. The Tin Woodman's castle is in the southern part of the Winky Country, and so it can't be a great way from here. Fearing they might drift too far, Dorothy and Ojo now stood up and raised the Scarecrow in their arms as high as they could, thus allowing him a good view of the country. For a time he saw nothing he recognized, but finally he cried, "'There it is! There it is!' "'What?' asked Dorothy. "'The Tin Woodman's castle! I can see its turrets glittering in the sun. It's quite a way off, but we'd better land as quickly as we can.' They let him down and began to urge the raft toward the shore by means of the pole. It obeyed very well, for the current was more sluggish now, and soon they had reached the bank and landed safely. The winky country was really beautiful, and across the fields they could see afar the silvery sheen of the tin castle. With light hearts they hurried toward it, being fully rested by their long ride on the river. By and by they began to cross an immense field of splendid yellow lilies, the delicate fragrance of which was very delightful. "'How beautiful they are!' cried Dorothy, stopping to admire the perfection of these exquisite flowers. "'Yes,' said the Scarecrow reflectively, "'but we must be careful not to crush or injure any of these lilies.' "'Why not?' asked Dojo. "'The Tin Woodman is very kind-hearted,' was the reply, "'and he hates to see any living thing hurt in any way.' "'Are flowers alive?' asked Scraps. "'Yes, of course, and these flowers belong to the Tin Woodman, "'so in order not to offend him we must not tread on a single blossom.' Once, said Dorothy, the tin woodman stepped on a beetle and killed the little creature. That made him very unhappy, and he cried until his tears rusted his joints, so he couldn't move them. What did he do then? asked Ojo. Put oil on them until the joints worked smooth again. Oh! exclaimed the boy, as if a great discovery had flashed across his mind. But he did not tell anybody what the discovery was, and kept the idea to himself. It was a long walk, but a pleasant one, and they did not mind it a bit. Late in the afternoon they drew near to the wonderful tin castle of the Emperor of the Winkies, and Ojo and Scraps, who had never seen it before, were filled with amazement. Tin abounded in the Winky country, and the Winkies were said to be the most skillful tinsmiths in all the world. So the tin woodman had employed them in building his magnificent castle, which was all of tin from the ground to the tallest turret, and so brightly polished that it glittered in the sun's rays more gorgeously than silver. Around the grounds of the castle ran a tin wall with tin gates, but the gates stood wide open because the emperor had no enemies to disturb him. When they entered the spacious grounds, our travellers found more to admire. Tin fountains sent sprays of clear water far into the air, and there were many beds of tin flowers, all as perfectly formed as any natural flowers might be. There were tin trees, too, and here and there shady bowers of tin, with tin benches and chairs to sit upon. Also on the sides of the pathway leading up to the front door of the castle were rows of tin statuary, very cleverly executed. Among these Ojo recognized statues of Dorothy, Toto, the Scarecrow, the Wizard, the Shaggy Man, Jack Pumpkinhead, and Ozma, all standing upon neat pedestals of tin. Toto was well acquainted with the residence of the Tin Woodman, and being assured a joyful welcome, he ran ahead and barked so loudly at the front door that the Tin Woodman heard him and came out in person to see if it were really his old friend Toto. Next moment the Tin Man had clasped the Scarecrow in a warm embrace, and then turned to hug Dorothy. But now his eye was arrested by the strange sight of the patchwork girl, and he gazed upon her in mingled wonder and admiration. End of chapter 26 Recording by Eric Leach, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Twenty-seven of the Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cheryl Martin. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 27. The Tin Woodman Objects The Tin Woodman was one of the most important personages in all Oz. Though Emperor of the Winkies, he owed allegiance to Ozma, who ruled all the land, and the girl and the Tin Man were warm, personal friends. He was something of a dandy and kept his tin body brilliantly polished and his tin joints well oiled. 
Also, he was very courteous in manner and so kind and gentle that everyone loved him. The emperor greeted Ojo and Scraps with cordial hospitality and ushered the entire party into his handsome tin parlor, where all the furniture and pictures were made of tin. The walls were paneled with tin, and from the tin ceiling hung tin chandeliers. The tin woodman wanted to know, first of all, where Dorothy had found the patchwork girl. So between them the visitors told the story of how Scraps was made, as well as the accident to Margolot and Unc Nunky, and how Ojo had set out upon a journey to procure the things needed for the crooked magician's magic charm. Then Dorothy told of their adventures in the Quadling country, and how at last they succeeded in getting the water from a dark well. While the little girl was relating these adventures, the tin woodman sat in an easy chair, listening with intense interest, while the others sat grouped around him. Ojo, however, had kept his eyes fixed upon the body of the tin emperor, and now he noticed that under the joint of his left knee a tiny drop of oil was forming. He watched this drop of oil with a fast-beating heart, and feeling in his pocket, brought out a tiny vial of crystal, which he held secreted in his hand. Presently the tin woodman changed his position, and at once Ojo, to the astonishment of all, dropped to the floor and held his crystal vial under the emperor's knee joint. Just then the drop of oil fell, and the boy caught it in his bottle and immediately corked it tight. Then, with a red face and embarrassed manner, he rose to confront the others. "'What in the world were you doing?' asked the tin woodman. "'I caught a drop of oil that fell from your knee joint,' confessed Ojo. "'A drop of oil?' exclaimed the tin woodman. "'Dear me, how careless my valet must have been in oiling me this morning. I'm afraid I shall have to scold the fellow, for I can't be dropping oil wherever I go.' "'Never mind,' said Dorothy. Ojo seems glad to have the oil, for some reason. Yes, declared the munchkin boy, I am glad, for one of the things the crooked magician sent me to get was a drop of oil from a live man's body. I had no idea at first that there was such a thing, but it's now safe in the little crystal vial. You are very welcome to it, indeed, said the tin woodman. Have you now secured all the things you were in search of? "'Not quite all,' answered Ojo. "'There were five things I had to get, and I have found four of them. "'I have the three hairs in the tip of a woozy's tail, "'a six-leaved clover, a gill of water from a dark well, "'and a drop of oil from a live man's body. "'The last thing is the easiest of all to get, "'and I'm sure that my dear Unc Nunky, and good Margolot as well, "'will soon be restored to life.' "'The munchkin boy said this with much pride and pleasure. "'Good!' exclaimed the tin woodman. I congratulate you. But what is the fifth and last thing you need in order to complete the magic charm? The left wing of a yellow butterfly, said Ojo. In this yellow country, and with your kind assistance, that ought to be very easy to find. The tin woodman stared at him in amazement. Surely you're joking, he said. No, replied Ojo, much surprised. I am in earnest. "'But do you think for a moment that I would permit you, or anyone else, "'to pull the left wing from a yellow butterfly?' demanded the tin woodman sternly. "'Why not, sir? Why not? You ask me why not? "'It would be cruel, one of the most cruel and heartless deeds I ever heard of,' "'asserted the tin woodman. "'The butterflies are among the prettiest of all created things, "'and they are very sensitive to pain.' To tear a wing from one would cause it exquisite torture, and it would soon die in great agony. I would not permit such a wicked deed under any circumstances. Ojo was astounded at hearing this. Dorothy, too, looked grave and disconcerted, but she knew in her heart that the tin woodman was right. The scarecrow nodded his head in approval of his friend's speech, so it was evident that he agreed with the emperor's decision. Scraps looked from one to another in perplexity. "'Who cares for a butterfly?' she asked. "'Don't you?' inquired the tin woodman. "'Not the snap of a finger, for I have no heart,' said the patchwork girl. "'But I want to help Ojo, who is my friend, to rescue the uncle whom he loves, and I'd kill a dozen useless butterflies to enable him to do that.' The tin woodman sighed regretfully. 
"'You have kind instincts,' he said, "'and with a heart you would indeed be a fine creature. "'I cannot blame you for your heartless remark, "'as you cannot understand the feelings of those who possess hearts. "'I, for instance, have a very neat and responsive heart, "'which the wonderful Wizard of Oz once gave me. "'And so I shall never, never, never permit a poor yellow butterfly "'to be tortured by anyone.' The yellow country of the Winkies, said Ojo sadly, is the only place in Oz where a yellow butterfly can be found. I'm glad of that, said the tin woodman. As I rule the Winky country, I can protect my butterflies. Unless I get the wing, just one left wing, said Ojo miserably. I can't save Unc Nunky. Then he must remain a marble statue forever, declared the tin emperor firmly. Ojo wiped his eyes, for he could not hold back the tears. "'I'll tell you what to do,' said Scraps. "'We'll take a whole yellow butterfly, alive and well, to the crooked magician and let him pull the left wing off.' "'No, you won't,' said the tin woodman. "'You can't have one of my dear little butterflies to treat in that way.' "'Then what in the world shall we do?' asked Dorothy. They all became silent and thoughtful. No one spoke for a long time. Then the tin woodman suddenly roused himself and said, "'We must all go back to the Emerald City and ask Ozma's advice. She's a wise little girl, our ruler, and she may find a way to help Ojo save his Unk Nunky.' So the following morning the party started on the journey to the Emerald City, which they reached in due time without any important adventure. It was a sad journey for Ojo, for without the wing of the yellow butterfly he saw no way to save Unk Nunky.' unless he waited six years for the crooked magician to make a new lot of the powder of life. The boy was utterly discouraged, and as he walked along, he groaned aloud. "'Is anything hurting you?' inquired the tin woodman in a kindly tone, for the emperor was with the party. "'I'm Ojo the Unlucky,' replied the boy. "'I might have known I would fail in anything I tried to do.' "'Why are you Ojo the Unlucky?' asked the tin man." "'because I was born on a Friday.' "'Friday is not unlucky,' declared the emperor. "'It's just one of seven days. "'Do you suppose all the world becomes unlucky one-seventh of the time?' "'It was the thirteenth day of the month,' said Ojo. Thirteen, "'Ah, that is indeed a lucky number,' replied the tin woodman. "'All my good luck seems to happen on the thirteenth. "'I suppose most people never notice the good luck that comes to them with the number thirteen. And yet, if the least bit of bad luck falls on that day, they blame it to the number, and not to the proper cause. Thirteen's my lucky number, too, remarked the scarecrow. And mine, said Scraps. I've just thirteen patches on my head. But, continued Ojo, I'm left-handed. Many of our greatest men are that way, asserted the emperor. To be left-handed is usually to be two-handed. The right-handed people are usually one-handed. "'And I've a wart under my right arm,' said Ojo. "'How lucky!' cried the tin woodman. "'If it were on the end of your nose it might be unlucky, "'but under your arm it is luckily out of the way.' "'For all those reasons,' said the munchkin boy, "'I have been called Ojo the Unlucky. "'Then we must turn over a new leaf "'and call you henceforth Ojo the Lucky,' declared the tin man. "'Every reason you have given is absurd.' "'But I have noticed that those who continually dread ill luck "'and fear it will overtake them "'have no time to take advantage of any good fortune that comes their way. "'Make up your mind to be Ojo the Lucky.' "'How can I?' asked the boy, "'when all my attempts to save my dear uncle have failed. "'Never give up, Ojo,' advised Dorothy. "'No one ever knows what's going to happen next.' "'Ojo did not reply.' but he was so dejected that even their arrival at the Emerald City failed to interest him. The people joyfully cheered the appearance of the Tin Woodman, the Scarecrow, and Dorothy, who were all three general favorites, and on entering the royal palace word came to them from Ozma that she would at once grant them an audience. Dorothy told the girl ruler how successful they had been in their quest until they came to the item of the yellow butterfly, which the tin woodman positively refused to sacrifice to the magic potion. "'He is quite right,' said Ozma, who did not seem a bit surprised. 
Had Ojo told me that one of the things he saw was the wing of a yellow butterfly, I would have informed him, before he started out, that he could never secure it. Then you would have been saved the troubles and annoyances of your long journey. I didn't mind the journey at all, said Dorothy. It was fun. As it has turned out, remarked Ojo, I can never get the things the crooked magician sent me for. And so, unless I wait the six years for him to make the powder of life, Unc Nunky cannot be saved. Ozma smiled. Dr. Pipt will make no more powder of life, I promise you, said she. I have sent for him and had him brought to this palace, where he now is, and his four kettles have been destroyed, and his book of recipes burned up. I've also had brought here the marble statues of your uncle and of Margolot, which are standing in the next room. They were all greatly astonished at this announcement. "'Oh, let me see Unc Nunk, let me see him at once, please,' cried Ojo eagerly. "'Wait a moment,' replied Ozma, "'for I have something more to say. "'Nothing that happens in the land of Oz "'escapes the notice of our wise sorceress, Glinda the Good. "'She knew all about the magic-making of Dr. Pipt, "'and how he had brought the glass cat and the patchwork girl to life, "'and the accident to Unc Nunky and Margolot, "'and of Ojo's quest and his journey with Dorothy.' Glinda also knew that Ojo would fail to find all the things he sought, so she sent for our wizard and instructed him what to do. Something is going to happen in this palace presently, and that something will, I'm sure, please you all. And now, continued the girl ruler, rising from her chair, you may follow me into the next room. End of chapter 27 28 of The Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cheryl Martin. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 28 The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. When Ojo entered the room, he ran quickly to the statue of Unc Nunky and kissed the marble face affectionately. "'I did my best, Unc,' he said with a sob, "'but it was no use.' Then he drew back and looked around the room, and the sight of the assembled company quite amazed him. Aside from the marble statues of Unc Nunky and Margolot, the glass cat was there, curled up on a rug, and the woozy was there, sitting on its square hind legs and looking on the scene with solemn interest. And there was the shaggy man, in a suit of shaggy pea-green satin, and at a table sat the little wizard, looking quite important and as if he knew much more than he cared to tell. Last of all, Dr. Pipt was there, and the crooked magician sat humped up in a chair, seeming very dejected, but keeping his eyes fixed on the lifeless form of his wife Margolot, whom he fondly loved, but whom he now feared was lost to him forever. Ozma took a chair which Jellia Jam wheeled forward for the ruler, and back of her stood the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman and Dorothy, as well as the Cowardly Lion and the Hungry Tiger. The wizard now arose and made a low bow to Ozma and another less deferent bow to the assembled company. "'Ladies and gentlemen and beasts,' he said, I beg to announce that our gracious ruler has permitted me to obey the commands of the great sorceress Glinda the Good, whose humble assistant I am proud to be. We have discovered that the crooked magician has been indulging in his magical arts contrary to law, and therefore, by royal edict, I hereby deprive him of all power to work magic in the future. He is no longer a crooked magician, but a simple munchkin. He is no longer even crooked but a man like other men. As he pronounced these words, the wizard waved his hand toward Dr. Pipt, and instantly every crooked limb straightened out and became perfect. The former magician, with a cry of joy, sprang to his feet, looked at himself in wonder, and then fell back in his chair and watched the wizard with fascinated interest. The glass cat, which Dr. Pipt lawlessly made, continued the wizard, is a pretty cat, but its pink brains made it so conceited that it was a disagreeable companion to everyone. So the other day I took away the pink brains and replaced them with transparent ones, 
and now the glass cat is so modest and well-behaved that Ozma has decided to keep her in the palace as a pet. "'I thank you,' said the cat in a soft voice. "'The woozy has proved himself a good woozy and a faithful friend,' the wizard went on. "'So we will send him to the royal menagerie, where he will have good care and plenty to eat all his life.' "'Much obliged,' said the woozy. "'That beats being fenced up in a lonely forest and starved.' "'As for the patchwork girl,' resumed the wizard, "'she is so remarkable in appearance, and so clever and good-tempered, "'that our gracious ruler intends to preserve her carefully "'as one of the curiosities of the curious land of Oz. "'Scraps may live in the palace, or wherever she pleases, "'and be nobody's servant but her own.' "'That's all right,' said Scraps. "'We have all been interested in Ojo,' the little wizard continued, because his love for his unfortunate uncle has led him bravely to face all sorts of dangers, in order that he might rescue him. The munchkin boy has a loyal and generous heart, and has done his best to restore Unc Nunky to life. He has failed, but there are others more powerful than the crooked magician, and there are more ways than Dr. Pip knew of to destroy the charm of the liquid of petrifaction. Glinda the Good has told me of one way, and you shall now learn how great is the knowledge and power of our peerless sorceress. As he said this, the wizard advanced to the statue of Margolot and made a magic pass, at the same time muttering a magic word that none could hear distinctly. At once the woman moved, turned her head wonderingly this way and that, to note all who stood before her, and seeing Dr. Pipt, ran forward and threw herself into her husband's outstretched arms. Then the wizard made the magic pass, and spoke the magic word before the statue of Unc Nunky. The old munchkin immediately came to life, and with a low bow to the wizard said, Thanks. But now Ojo rushed up, and threw his arms joyfully about his uncle, and the old man hugged his little nephew tenderly, and stroked his hair, and wiped away the boy's tears with a handkerchief, for Ojo was crying from pure happiness. Ozma came forward to congratulate them. I have given to you, my dear Ojo and Unc Nunky, a nice house just outside the walls of the Emerald City, she said, and there you shall make your future home and be under my protection. Didn't I say you were Ojo the Lucky? asked the Tin Woodman, as everyone crowded around to shake Ojo's hand. Yes, and it is true, replied Ojo gratefully. End of chapter 28 End of The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum